Wednesday, yes. Uh, and thanks so much for putting this together. I think it's a very important series of events. Uh, I'll start, I guess, with a little bit of a trigger warning or a, uh, an admission that I've never actually talked about this stuff in public before. So um, bear with me about it. Uh, just as a background, I live, let me get my notes out, in West Belfast. I lived in a war zone uh, for about 30 years. This was literally a war zone that I was living in. So we were having sort of daily events uh, of the kind that we're here to talk about. And I just thought whenever the call went out from Gina that I might be able to say some things that will be of use or at least interest to people when they think about uh, what it means to be living in a place where there is the possibility that things like the events of, of August the 3rd, the shooting and killings of August the 3rd, uh, happen. So, a little bit about Belfast. This should look familiar to you. It's a city of many walls. These things are uh, kind of ridiculously called peace walls. And they're meant to keep populations apart from each other. But they're also meant to pin populations in to their districts. Uh, and so that they can be managed by what are, you know, famously called the security forces, which is basically the British Army and the Royal Ulster Constabulary, which until recently was an all-Protestant police force that um, basically was let loose on the Catholic population of Northern Ireland. So being particularly a young male person, and although I'm not Catholic, but living in a Catholic district meant that, you know, I was kind of subject to a daily uh, threat of abuse and, you know, was living in a place very much like this, although not quite so close to the wall. At part, part of the time I was there, I was living very close to one of these walls. So there you have the comparison. We, we both are living in divided cities, or we're all living in divided cities. And, you know, the landscape may be different, but many of the effects are the same in terms of the way that the wall is meant to divide a population uh, and to keep certain people out, uh, as well as keeping certain people in. These are bridges in Belfast. The uh, bridge on the right is not a bridge in Belfast that should look familiar to you. That's the uh, putting up of razor wire on the Santa Fe Bridge. Uh, the one on the other side is a bridge that spans out of the Catholic area, Catholic district, into the city center uh, in, in Belfast and goes across a kind of wasteland that has been built to keep Catholic and Protestant populations apart. These are the dates of construction of the walls. There are 99 walls. Uh, they began being built in 1969 when the violence began to become um, a lot, uh, and then were built at a fairly rapid rate uh, through the subsequent decades. I lived in West Belfast, which was really the center of the conflict uh, in what would, is called Northern Ireland. So these are some pictures of where all the walls are. I lived down here on the Falls Road and then up in Andersonstown during the 30 years that I lived in Belfast. There's a mixed area here, which of course is where the university is, so there's not a lot of trouble there. Um, and when I first went to Belfast and I was there as a visitor to the university, I was told that I was not supposed to be in this green area over here. And in fact, they hired me some 20 years later, I guess, in 1994, uh, as a professor of sociology and uh, the word got back to me that one of the deans, uh, assistant deans, said, how can they hire that O'Hearn guy? You know, he, he was never out of West Belfast. So that was the kind of uh, sort of thing that we were living in. This is just Ireland. Northern Ireland was created under the um, Division of Ireland Act in, in 1921, which basically took the six counties that could be guaranteed to remain Protestant almost in per perpetuity, although this has recently begun to change. Uh, the Northern Ireland is also called Ulster sometimes, but Ulster is actually nine counties, and they took three counties out of it. 
and then built the uh, built the borders so that they could maintain a, a Protestant majority. Uh, they uh, discriminated in housing, employment, and uh, various other things, and of course in the police force. So that the uh, policing of the area was very sectarian, uh, often quite violent, uh, and you know not so nice. So that's the actual uh, map of Ireland. You can see the red counties, Donegal, uh, Cavan, and uh, Monaghan, are have a big Catholic majority. And if they had been included, it would have been a Catholic majority uh, province. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so you, you, you're drawing comparisons between uh, walls in Ireland and here in on the borderland, um, and uh, you're talking about like in relations to violence. Do you think that walls themselves help cause some of the, the, the violence, or are they like a, a, a symbol for violence? Well, it, 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 they are a symbol of violence, yeah. They are, I, I consider them to be a form of violence in themselves, okay, because they are, in fact, you know, cutting uh, through a territory of people who are, in fact, a community. Uh, but in the case of Ireland, yeah, the walls were, in fact, something which enabled uh, particularly the security forces and Protestant, what were called paramilitaries, the Ulster Defense Association and the Ulster Volunteer Forces to go through the walls because they were managed and they would be opened at certain times or the security policing would just kind of disappear magically at times. Uh, what was the rationale for the wall? What the, the well, the rationale, the public rationale was that it kept the Protestants and Catholics apart and that they were in a war with each other, that was partly true. The real truth was that the Catholic population was in a war with the British government, which had occupied their territories and sent in the British army to occupy, and I'll show you some pictures in a second. Okay. Uh, so there were contending uh, narratives about what this was all about. It was always called a religious war, but, you know, it's a historically, it's an economic war, really, because the land of Ireland, which had been occupied by the Irish, was taken away uh, from the original inhabitants of the land and populated. You've heard the phrase plantation. Everybody yes. knows that phrase. Plantation is not about plants. Plantation is about people. The original plantations were the plantations of Northern Ireland, and they were to plant uh, migrants Scottish migrants and originally in the very south of Ireland, English migrants, uh, into those areas. They were given very large parts of land, quite often for, uh, in return for financing military campaigns against the Irish. So Cromwell and other people that you've heard of conducted military campaigns against the Irish in order to raise the money. Uh, they went to the business people and you know large landowners and so on throughout mostly England Mm -hmm. and promised them lands uh, in Ireland. And then plantations were given over to those uh, people who had given, uh, given money to finance the war and were peopled by uh, migrants who were brought in from, uh, from Scotland mostly. So you're saying that there was a group of migrants that were basically used at, by military factions or something in order to, I'm, I'm trying to track what you're saying, but are you saying that th this kind of started through the use of organizing migrants and putting them uh, in strategic places? Putting them in strategic places, giving them lands. Well, it's not really strategic places because the whole land of uh, Ulster was basically taken away from the original inhabitants and then regranted to the financiers of the wars. And the financiers of the wars then uh, gave plots of land in their plantations what year was this? to migrants. Oh, we're talking about the 17th century. Oh, okay. So before uh... it's 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 a long historical thing, which then boiled up after the division of Ireland, which which we see here. I the division of Ireland meant that this territory, the Purple One Ulster at the top, or Northern Ireland could be a majority Protestant area, and it was, it was then run as a sectarian state, where, as one of the prime ministers said, we have a Protestant parliament for a Protestant people. And that meant that, you know, Catholics found it very difficult to get jobs, they found it very difficult to get uh, housing, uh, certainly didn't get government jobs. 
which even, is like very contra, very, very different than what it, it's like in America, right? Well, I mean, there are, there are some parallels. <laughs> there certainly are some ethnic parallels to the way, to the, way the labor but, markets but, have been but, managed. But, but, I'm, I'm, I'm curious. curious. In this region, it would be identical until the late 1940s when uh, radical labor unions broke the back of systematic discrimination against Mexican people. Mm -hmm. and, and since then, it's, it's more complex. It's not that it's perfect since then, but you know, it, it, that is the history of this region. Yeah. My argument is not that this is the same. I'm just trying to, to give you a background. That's sure. All. And this is the way that this conflict emerged. So it's called a religious conflict because one side of the conflict is mostly Protestants, Presbyterians, Church of Ireland, mm -hmm. which is just the Irish version of the Church of England. Uh, but it, it, it is called uh, a religious war uh, because basically the state, the British state, has made it into uh, okay. Since you know, and this this whole area Ireland was was incorporated into Britain and the, the United Kingdom in 1801 by the Act of Union. Scotland was incorporated sometime earlier. So these were basically forcible acts that brought uh, these different districts together into the thing called the United Kingdom. There was like that, a gap, right, from like the <coughs> 1800s then to like now when Belfast was experiencing. The, the, when the, yeah, I mean, the, the, the violence the then broke out around 1967, but it became particularly big in 1969, and went on until peace, the peace process emerged in the 1990s. Uh, so it was basically a 30-year war mm -hmm. uh, that took place. This was my daily life, and this is really kind of what I wanted to get to, was uh, a daily life of shootings and bombings that were happening in various kinds of places, but on my streets, whenever I got up in the morning and I went out, this was what I had to avoid. Uh, because as a young man, particularly living in a Catholic area, you would be subject to being stopped, put up against the wall, searched, taken in for interrogation. There was a thing called the Prevention of Terrorism Act whereby I could be and was a number of times taken and detained for three hours at a time. And then if they decided they wanted to uh, detain me longer, they could keep me for seven days com completely incommunicado in an interrogation center, and that also happened. Uh, and, but that was like the daily life of many, many, uh, particularly Catholics, but also a lot of young Protestants who were living here at the time. Was that so, indiscriminate or did that just like, did they just like, just you walking down the street? It's because you're a male you were, living in an area. Uh, you wow. know, they had things in England called the sus laws at the time as well, in which someone who uh, was black living in certain areas of London or Manchester or Liverpool was also going to be picked up. So, by so the here police it could be either like. Excuse me, we're going to have a Q and A section. Sorry. So and we're live streaming. So I want to give our presenters time to present, and then you'll have your five minutes of Q and A. Thank you, Gina. Okay, this is really important. I just got a fifteen minute, and I haven't got into my thing yet. Okay, so uh, you know, so it was the British Army and the Royal Ulster constabulary that were kind of our daily existence that, that we were concerned about. Now, the daily concern then was a concern of avoiding those forces, basically, so that you could go about your daily life. And you would look around every corner, basically, uh, to try and avoid foot patrols. And you had to make choices about if you're coming across a foot patrol, do you try to turn around if they don't see you, or do you just walk through them uh, and hope that they won't stop you and so on. So that was kind of a, the daily existence. The other thing was a constant uh, number of helicopters overhead. So I remember one time, not you know, a few months after I first began living there, I woke up in the morning and I went outside and I said, you know, there's a really, really funny sound. What is this? I couldn't identify what the sound was. And then after about a minute or two, I realized that the sound I was hearing was the absence of helicopters. And I sort of said to myself, I, you know, should I really be here? Um, so the, that was one side of things. The other side of things was random violence. As I said, there were these paramilitary groups called uh, 
well, the Ulster Defense Association and the Ulster Volunteer Force. And they basically, often with the collusion of the army and the police, uh, would mount campaigns which sometimes were targeted against particular people, but sometimes were just sectarian campaigns that go into a Catholic area and shoot Catholics. So it was like drive-by shootings, sometimes bombings, but usually shootings. And there were certain areas of Belfast that were known as murder miles. So there were about three of these things. One was in front of the gas works, for example, a long wall. And if you had to walk along that wall, you walked very fast and you tried to get out of there because you knew that there was a high probability that there could be a shooting. So there were two things about the response to violence, particularly random violence. And one of them was, it was always, I always looked at it as probabilities. What's the probability that this is going to happen to me? And I think this is probably relevant to the subject that we've been talking about today and yesterday. The probabilities that something will happen to you, even at the height of the violence, were extremely low. Belfast, in the center of the war, actually had a lower murder rate than Detroit and Houston. But the, the murder rate was more focused. Uh, even though it was random within certain areas, it was more focused and of a certain kind than it, than it would have been in many other places. Uh, so the probability that something would happen to you, as the probability that you would walk into Walmart and be shot, was extremely low. I always reminded myself of this, you know, and it brought me a certain amount of comfort uh, in this kind of a situation that uh, I, I wasn't likely to face this. And the probability then would be reduced tremendously by your own actions and by your smartness. So you don't be in certain places at certain times when you know that these things are more likely to happen. You don't be in the murder mile at night when you know that the, there's the highest likelihood that a drive-by shooting will happen. But I do remember, for example, one time being out with a friend after a few drinks, going across an area that had a long wall where these kinds of things would happen, and a car came behind us and slowed down. We didn't jump over the wall. The car didn't turn out to be a drive-by shooting. They just, just slowed down and sped off. I think they thought maybe they recognized one of us. But we turned to each other and we said, you know, why were we more worried about being embarrassed by jumping over a wall to save ourselves, in, just in case this wasn't an attack, than we were about actually being attacked and being killed? So there are some really interesting things, I think, about human behavior. That, you know, there's certain kinds of things about our identity and that, that we protect in a certain kind of a way and that those things are very, very valuable to us. So we didn't jump over the wall and, and afterwards told ourselves, wow, that was really, really stupid. Um, so the probability can be decreased by smartness, but as with mass imprisonment, which was also going on at the time, the likelihood is very high that you know someone who is either going to have been killed or put in jail for probably a long period of time. So within months of my arriving uh, in Belfast, uh, there was a certain place where we would go to socialize and I got friendly with a young fellow named Paul. And Paul was shot and killed uh, very soon after. And, you know, that was only the first of many, 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 many people who I knew who were killed either by the British Army, by the uh, police force, or in these random shootings by, the, by, by Protestant paramilitaries. So the incidence was low, but this is kind of the two-sided kind of contradictory thing about having such a strong community, as is true in, in El Paso as well. The likelihood that you would have been shot at Walmart is extremely low. The likelihood that you know someone who was affected by this and who had people who were shot is extremely high. And this is, is something that we have to deal with. There are a couple of very interesting concepts. One, of course, you're familiar with is called PTSD. And, you know, you have it when you go through these kinds of incidents and when you live in these kinds of things. PTSD is something that you have. 
But one thing that the experts haven't talked about as much, and they haven't made a distinction between PTSD and moral injury. Moral injury is about the things that you do or you feel you didn't do that you feel guilty about. Many of the people who live in this community, for example, are ex-soldiers. When that thing happened in Walmart, they may have felt PTSD, but there's a very high likelihood that they also had feelings of moral injury that it brought into mind what they had been forced to do as soldiers in various parts of the world. Uh, or for people who said, you know, why wasn't I there? Or someone who survived when someone else didn't survive. Why wasn't it me? You know, and you hear that all the time after these kinds of in incidents. So I think moral injury uh, is an extremely important concept that really hasn't been talked about much. There's some work by a woman, Alice Lind, who's a partner of Stoughton Lind. They're both very famous human rights and civil rights activists in this country. And, and Alice Lind's work on moral injury, I think, is extremely important in this regard. Very quickly, how did people fight this? And here I'm back in Belfast again. How did we fight it? Some people fought it literally. They joined the Irish Republican Army. Uh, they joined the Irish National Liberation Army, or they joined the Ulster Volunteer Force, or one of those organizations. And that was very, very common, especially a young, among young men, and it's a reason why the police were stopping everybody uh, walking along the street. So fighting it literally was one way that people responded. <clears throat> On a very widespread basis, they fought it with drugs. Uh, especially women were given Valium. And it was basically said that Valium was women's uh, weapon against what we would now call PTSD. So they were just going through life drug, and the proportions of particularly adult women who were basically on Valium or diazepam or another drug like that all the time, it's extremely high. And you know, if you compare that to some of the opiate and other things that are happening here now. Alcohol, of course, I mean, this is Ireland. <laughs> but alcohol was, was a very uh, important way of fighting it. And staying inside just staying inside. So many people lived their lives inside because if they went outside, they ran the danger of harassment and uh, possibly violence. Um, I can remember one of the things that we had to think about was that uh, the army made raids. They raided houses every morning before sunup because they wanted to get people while they were still drowsy and asleep. And yes, it's a thing I went through a few times. And you always felt good and safe when you heard the milk bottles in the morning. Because it meant that the milkman had come around, the sun had come up, and then you could actually sleep because you didn't fear that, that uh, a British Army raid might happen on your house or on your neighbor's houses or people around you. Now, how did, how did people react to it positively? And I think this is the main thing that I really, really want to get across, is that the most important thing that the people in the war zones and where I lived in West Belfast had was community. They had a greater sense of community than anywhere I've ever, ever been in my life, and they held on to each other. They supported each other. They provided mutual aid to each other at a rate that I have never, ever seen. Everybody looked after each other. And community, I think, was, in fact, the strongest weapon that they had against what was going on, because everybody knew in bad times that everyone face bad times together in the community. In good times, or just on daily life, you always had people to go to. And I knew people who didn't have a job, I mean the unemployment rates were 70 and 80 percent in these areas that I'm talking about, who had no job. They never had to worry about a place to sleep or a, a meal to eat. 
And they could go from door to door and place to place, and they would always be looked after by people in the community. And that was really the most important thing. Along with that, of course, is a sense of welcome. The ancient Irish Brehon laws, which preceded the conquest of Ireland by the, by the English, one of the very central concepts was the welcome to the stranger. And Ireland, to this very day, is called the island of 100,000 welcomes, Cade Milifolcha. And you will see that when you go to Ireland, everywhere you go, Cade Milifolcha. And they have maintained, through all of these centuries of occupation, division, uh, a sense that welcoming people is the, is really the most important thing. And that is, along with community, I think, the thing which has been most important for those people uh, in, in that area. And again, the parallels, I think, with El Paso are, are tremendous. And I think that's something we really, really need to hold close to our hearts. This is a very welcoming community. There are very strong social networks throughout the community, so it really is a community or a, or a, or a a bunch of communities, and they cross over those walls and they cross over those borders, and we have to hold on to that. We, we have to cherish and hold on to the welcoming spirit that we have here. If that breaks down, then events like what happened in Walmart really can defeat a community, but as long as you hold on to those things, uh, that's really the, the most important thing. There are other things. The pub, people come together in places. They see each other. You know, people don't sit at home. I mean, I just said that people do sit at home, and they, they often do sit at home, but they, the one place they leave home for is to go to the pub. <laughs> and that's where they can, they, they can relax. They can be a community. They can see their family and friends. They can talk about old times. They can do all of these things. And, you know, people do drink there. Some don't drink there. There are some people who go to the pub not to drink but just to be together, to be in community. And it's, it's important to have those places where we come together and we are together and we, and we become a community. Faith as well has been important, but as you see, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, being a devout Catholic or a devout Protestant can, on the one hand, help. You know, Marx, in his famous quote, said, faith is the opiate of the masses and everybody stops there. But what did he say after that? He said it's the, the heart of, of a heartless world. And the flower on the chain of oppression. Sorry? The flower on the chain of oppression. Yeah. I think that's the other part of the sentence. Yeah. And, you know, that is, is one side of what religion uh, enabled uh, people to do, you know, on, on all sides in, in Northern Ireland, is that it did help them get through this thing, but it also became a barrier and a problem in many cases, obviously, because people were <coughs> fighting each other because they were of different religions. But also there, there was a real division that opened up between the clergy and the people of the Catholic Church because the clergy were basically identified with the state, and that was a very interesting kind of thing that came out of it. In a way, it, it intensified the community spirit of that, of that community as well. So. Maybe the clergy were doing a favor for the, for the Catholic people by being a kind of oppositional force apart from the state that they could kind of come together to talk about how do we deal with these people. These are our people, and how do we deal with them? So those are some of the things I just wanted to say, uh, and, and anything from this. Community and welcome are our most powerful weapons. They really are our most powerful weapons, and we have to hang on to them dearly. Okay, thank you. Do we have time? Let's take a, just a couple of questions. Okay, yeah. Do you see any parallels with um, groups that are organizing today with maybe like anti-fascist groups that, do uh, you see any parallels with groups organizing in Belfast and organizing today here on the border? There's a lot of ways to be anti-fascist, uh, you know, and, and there's a whole range of activities. I think one of the issues that came up a lot in Northern Ireland was the distinction between militarist and militant, mm -hmm. and often those two things get combined together. 
So if someone is militantly against something, in the sense that they are willing to take risks, now those risks could be, I mean, you know, we've seen uh, Buddhist monks burn themselves. That's a militant activity, but it's not a form of violence against other people. It's just an activity which, and we have hunger strikes in Ireland, and, and there are hunger strikes here as, as we go on. Hunger strikes, we could see as a form of a militant activity. It's the only weapon that one has left is their body. To use that as a spiritual and, and a, a, a powerful weapon against the authorities for what they're doing. Uh, and that was another very important part of the Brown laws of the ancient law of Ireland as well, which we brought forward. So there's a lot of ways. I mean, I would hope that all of us are against fascism. Possibly not. So we're all anti fog But how do we do it? Is, if is you see that, that, no, let's let some other people get in. I mean, there may be others who have. I'm not anti Well, thank you for your presentation. So I just wanted to know if you. Um, to share with us more about your sub subjective experience, if you could share the emotional parallels. What is it like to be there where you were in the Belfast? And then what is uh, and then the comparison, commonalities, similarities with living here uh, in La Frontera? Um, well, fortunately, I haven't faced the kind of violence uh, that others, you know, would have faced, and even I would be identified as an old white male now. Mm -hmm. So I had that advantage, you know, it's very different from being identified as a young white Catholic uh, when I was living there. It gives me, I think, an understanding and an empathy of what, you know, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement is about and what other movements are about, uh, having kind of had to face up to that. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that are very deep that like, I couldn't even explain. I, mean, you know, I lived through the hunger strikes and I saw many of the men who died, there were 10 men who died in hunger strikes in Irish prisons. And having seen them in the, you know, when they say the state that they were in their coffins, uh, there are just some things that you, should never have to be experienced. Mm -hmm. Having seen young children who were shot with plastic bullets in, the <clears throat> in their coffins, mm -hmm. uh, those are things that should never be, and one should never uh, face. I, I couldn't even begin to describe. I mean, I wrote a book about one of the most famous on the hunger strike, Bobby Sands, the biography of uh, Bobby. My dissertation is on transnational corporations in Ireland. Mm -hmm. And I did it in Dublin. And that was in the mid-1980s. Mm -hmm. I finished and came back and worked in, in Wisconsin in 1988. And there was a reason why my dissertation was about the transnational corporate investments in Ireland and their impact on the Irish economy and health and well-being. Because I couldn't face researching those things. And it was only after the peace process and after some 30 years, or in the case of the uh, hunger strikes, 15 to 20 years, 30 years later when it, when it actually came out, 81, 25 years the book came out. It was only <coughs> that I could face, even, even face these things in an, in an academic way, in an intellectual way. So there are some things Thank you very much, Thank Dr. You. Thank you.